lyricists have a wonderful advantage. Because if we ever get letters that start off with the idea that you can make a perpetual motion machine, which this essentially is, we can throw them out. Unread. Now, I, I will say that there is, I mean, you, you need to at least, at some level, acknowledge that this was a clever thought experiment. And it turns out that the way that, that modern philosophers of science have resolved this is by thinking of the, the, the demon having to make this measurement as basically having a register, I, this is why I drew it as a robot, having a register in its brain at which, in which you have to make the calculation. Is this moving faster or slower than some threshold? And having done that, when the next atom comes along, you have to erase it. And erasing that increases, uh, increases the entropy of the universe by sort of connecting this to the outside system. In other words, there is an overall, there is an overall entropy to the universe that seems to be increasing. Now we do not know, and, I, and this is almost as much as I can say about it, we do not know whether it is the increase in entropy that causes the arrow of time, or whether the arrow of time defines the increase in entropy. We do not know which is more fundamental. I'm happy to entertain those sorts of things and questions in a few minutes when we get to them. So we seem to have these, we seem to have these symmetries, these fundamental symmetries, and many of these symmetries seem to be writ large. So I've got some astronomical diagrams here. Um, on the left, I've got galaxies from the Slow Digital Sky Survey, those empty regions. We, we are essentially the center, and as you get further from the center, uh, we're talking about further and further from, from the Earth. Uh, those white regions on the side are just places that the survey hasn't looked, and um, each dot is a galaxy. And what you will see there is the northern part of the sky and the southern part of the sky contain about as many galaxies. The universe seems to be the same in both directions. To the right-hand side, we've got the cosmic microwave background, a map of the whole sky of the early universe, temperature map, in which the blue parts are slightly colder than average by about one part in 100,000, and the, the, the hot parts are about hotter than average by about one part in 100,000. So number one, the universe is ridiculously uniform at early times, number one. And number two is the overall properties seem to be pretty much the same wherever you look. So writ large, the universe seems to be pretty symmetric. So we get to the deep question, the, the title of the talk, which is why do symmetries fundamentally matter? Like we, we can, I can give example after example and say, oh, isn't that cool? But there's a deeper explanation to it, a deeper explanation that gives us a handle on how our laws of, of physics are constructed. And we owe them to one of the greatest <laughs> unknown or I think underknown mathematicians uh, around. This is uh, Emmy Noether. So, you know, there's a bit of there's a bit of biography here. I mean, this is not that long ago. Uh, Emmy Noether, she's a German, almost exact contemporary of, of, of Einstein, um, and you'll see that some of some of the the details of her story parallel Einstein significantly. So, some of them are gender specific. For example, you know, she, she came from an academic family. Her father, Max, was a, was a very eminent scientist. And so, for example, um, she wasn't, in this case, able to even sit for a physics degree, so she had to like, audit all the classes and take the exams sort of on her own, which she aced. She was able to get a PhD, top of her class, and then basically do nothing, because there were no academic opportunities open to her. It wasn't until Einstein, and this, that should have some similarities open to Einstein, compared to Einstein, of course, spent the early 1900s in the Swiss patent office. It wasn't until Einstein came up with his theory of general relativity that Noether, who concentrated her mathematics research on symmetry, was sort of called up to the majors. She was, uh, she was brought to Göttingen by uh, David Hilbert, who advocated for her constantly. Um, you know, the, the university wasn't willing to give her any pay or any title, but he basically said, I don't see that the sex of the candidate, this is a classic quote by him, is an argument against her admission as a um, essentially associate professor. After all, we are a university, not a bathhouse. He said on many occasions, you know, it is ridiculous that she should have a preferred position to me, you know, for somebody who is basically my superior in many ways. But what Noether did, I mean, she, she basically there were many classes that were taught by Hilbert with sort of permanent substitute Emmy Noether. Um, but almost immediately upon arriving in Göttingen, she came up with what, what became known as 
know this theorem. Um, just to sort of finish it up, and I'll describe know this theorem in just a moment. In 1933, she moved to Bryn Mawr College, very nearby, obviously, and she, she passed away about a year and a half later, complications due to cancer. Um, just a sort of note upon her passing from, from Einstein, the most significant creative mathematical genius thus far, uh, thus far produced since the higher education of women began. Incredibly, incredibly important figure, and yet, even in physics departments, this is a name that is almost unknown, and it's incredible that, that it is, because Noether explained why it is that symmetry is so foundational in physics. Basically what she showed is that every symmetry, every what's called continuous symmetry, every symmetry produces some sort of conserved quantities, and conserved quantities are the bread and butter of physics. Energy conservation is one of the first things you learn about uh, in, 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 in physics class. It's so fundamental, by the way, that it is the first law of thermodynamics. What Noether showed is that if the laws of physics are uniform over time, that immediately gives rise to conservation of energy. No, no, other, no additional work needs to be done. In other words, something that was seen to be fundamental, energy conservation, was based on something more fundamental. The laws of physics remain constant. Think about um, Newton's great accomplishment is, is three laws of motion, the first of which is objects in motion stay in motion, objects in rest, which is really the conservation of momentum. What Noether showed is that as long as the laws of physics are the same everywhere in space, you get that for free immediately. As long as the laws of physics are the same in every direction, you get conservation of angular momentum. And it goes deeper. This is, this is the sort of intimidating slide. I don't, you know, if you're not a mathematician, which is presumably just about everybody, do not be scared by this. What I want to show you from this is the things that, when you hear about the, the um, standard model of physics, this idea that all of physics is based on, well, this gravity plus three other forces, the electromagnetic force, the strong and the weak nuclear forces, would, would know they're ultimately, she didn't do herself, but was based on her work, showed was that there are fundamental symmetries to how particles interact, and those symmetries give rise to conservation laws, conservation of chi uh, charge, conservation of color, and so on, and they, they ultimately predict all of these things we call mediator particles, things like photons, the W and the Z particles, the gluon, and so forth, and ultimately, the Higgs. To give you a sort of graphical view of, of, of how this plays out, of how symmetry and uh, our modern laws of physics uh, are interrelated, this is just one way of showing all the particles that we know about. Now, if I plucked one of the particles, and, and this is clearly forms a very pleasing pattern. The horizontal, the, the vertical is the electric charge, and then the other diagonals show the various uh, weak interactions. This is one of many, many possible projections. But if I plucked one of those particles out, you would know it. You would know if there were particles missing. I mean, that's one of the things that symmetries tell us about. So know that formed the, the foundation, not just for, for our standard model of particle physics now, but ultimately for everything, you know, a lot of the ideas that we're putting forward to try to get to the next level of physics. You may have heard of something called supersymmetry, as maybe the idea of uh, this idea that, that might predict um, what dark matter really is, the stuff that holds galaxies together and so on, makes up uh, about five times as much as the ordinary matter of the universe. The idea was this, this particle called the lightest supersymmetric particle. And supersymmetry is yet another application of this to yet a deeper level, so foundational to, to our modern understanding of physics. So, okay, so let's take a step back. We, we have all of these symmetries, time and space, rotation and so on, that, that, that we use to describe the universe. They produce these beautifully symmetric laws. And yet, I gotta, gotta step back to the very important fact that you exist, right? Matter and antimatter are almost entirely alike, but they annihilate almost completely. They, in fact, they annihilate completely in every experiment that we've ever done. So why are you here? Every galaxy we've ever seen seems to be made of matter. We would see it in the universe if we saw matter and antimatter galaxies colliding with one another. The entire observable universe seemed to be made of matter. How did one win? How was that symmetry broken? Why is there structure? I mean, if, if you know, the most symmetric thing in the universe is for us to just be a uniform cloud of gas. Well, we live in a universe that has beautiful symmetries and laws, 
but we are fortunate in some sense that we live in a universe that also contains quantum mechanics. I mentioned quantum mechanics very, very uh, briefly in this mm -hmm. talk, and all you need to know about it is that quantum mechanics injects a note of randomness in the universe. So I, I, just as a closing thought, I want you to imagine the following. I want you to imagine row after row after row of identical tops spinning with an identical initial state with a surface that to any casual inspection appears perfectly uniform. Now, if you were taking this very literally, you'd expect these things to spin forever, but if you inject even the smallest amount of randomness, eventually one or two of those tops are going to start to topple. Which one? Which direction? We don't know. But once it happens, you're going to create an enormous amount of structure in what started off as fundamentally very symmetric. Now, the, 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 that is, of course, you know, how we end up with, with structure in the universe, how complicated structure in the universe. And so the question we don't know is how much of that randomness caused things that we now take as fundamental, like our three dimensions of space, and how much of it just created some of the structure in the universe. How much is sort of had to be that way and how much is random, that's the sort of next step in our level of understanding. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Um, follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and I write an Ask a Physicist column for IM9. Thank you very much. Uh, I, 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 I've set myself up for some, some hardball questions. I'm happy to take as many as you like. Um, I'll be selling books for, for 25. I've got my, my recent book and my, my slightly older book, um, and I'll be happy to sign whatever you have. So, questions? Yes. It seems that um, there are symmetries that are seen. I was thinking there are some that probably are unseen. Would you say quantum entanglement is a, uh, a symmetry? So uh, just so just because I have the mic. Um, yeah, I realized by the way I, I my head was turning a bit. I hope everyone was able to get all that. Good. Um, so the question was: Is quantum entanglement some sort of unseen or hidden symmetry? So quantum entanglement, if you've never encountered it, quantum entanglement is this idea that there are properties, uh, the one that's usually used as an example is something called spin. Uh, we talked about it with regards to the neutrinos. And you can, measure, you can measure the spin of one particle going in one direction, you can measure the spin of another particle going in another direction, and you can imagine two particles being created such that their spins were in exactly opposite directions. Now, because of quantum mechanics, you get a random component to that, and so if I measure the spin of this particle being this way, and I measure the spin of this particle being this way, they exactly balance. And the question is, you know, with, with quantum entanglement is, if I measure this, am I basically, you know, am I forcing this guy who's far away to be the opposite spin? Like, what does that even mean? The spin, the, the entanglement itself, is not a symmetry of the universe. But spin does relate to symmetries, absolutely. Um, you know, sp spin, it turns out, the idea of spin is sort of fundamental in our discovery, prediction of antimatter. So just to, just to sort of, I'm gonna switch course a little bit. So one of the things that uh, a fellow by the name of Dirac was, was very famous for is he looked at the, the motions of, um, of, of individual electrons. He tried to figure out how they would work if they moved close to the speed of light, and Dirac realized that there were four solutions to the, to the, uh, the, to the calculations, and those four solutions were all connected to one another. And he said, I sort of understand two of them. You know, a particle can be spin up and a particle can be spin down. But then he realized, you, you know, you can't just throw out the other two solutions, and the other two solutions turned out to be the antiparticle being spin up and the antiparticle being spin down. In other words, these things were all intertwined with one another. Now, what I'm getting at is that fundamentally comes from symmetry, and it comes from the symmetry that Einstein gave us. Can we say close to the speed of light? That, that's what Einstein, you know, the magic of Einstein, Einstein's symmetry was what's called Lorentz invariance, the idea that all the laws of physics don't care how fast you're moving. So the answer of does entanglement in particular, is that a symmetry? No. But is, are all of those steps of understanding how entanglement and spin and all of that, are all of those fundamentally resting on symmetries? Absolutely. There are other, there are other I think, even more hidden symmetries. And I'll, 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 give, I'll give one, and, and I've actually, 
believe it or not, show it to you on, on one of the slides, and it has to do also with quantum mechanics, and it's related to the idea of spin, which is that in quantum mechanics, we've got waves. If you knew nothing about quantum mechanics, you've heard wave equation and maybe nothing else. Well, the thing about a wave is, you know, a wave has all sorts of things. It's got a frequency, it's got a speed of propagation, it's got, um, it's got an amplitude, how high the wave is. But it also has something called a phase, which is, you know, basically the, the exact timing of the individual peaks. And it turns out, as far as quantum mechanics is concerned, we don't care about the exact timing of the wave. You can move the phase forward or backwards by a, a full shift, or any amount, and the laws would be exactly the same. This, again, that's a very hidden symmetry because it's one we can't ever measure. Um, and that is the symmetry that ultimately, because that seems to be a symmetry of the universe, that ultimately gives rise to all the laws of electromagnetism. Which is just like, you're like, what? One seems to have absolutely nothing to do with the other, and yet it just drops out once you know, once you know how to look for it. So, you know, the, the example you gave happens to not be a hidden symmetry, but there are so many that are related to the example that you gave that, that, that are. Yeah. I'm going back to the original definition given by Herman. Yep. Herman Weiss. And mm -hmm. wasn't there, I feel it's, you may feel it's trivial, but I thought it's important that what's missing from that definition is that the symmetry is a function of perspective. And because the different perspectives constitute, in my view, something analogous to the degree of freedom in, in, in the old mechanics. So, so, so the question was, okay, so, I wouldn't necessarily use the word perspective. So the question was, we go back to the, the original definition that I, that I gave you uh, from Herman Weil, which was, a thing is symmetric such that if something you do something to it, and after you do it, it looks the same as it did before. And you're absolutely right. Um, you're absolutely right that something can appear symmetric under certain circumstances, but not under others. So. I'm actually, I wasn't planning on, on going to the whiteboard, but I'm going to. Oh. <laughs> that, that pen is dead. Ray, do you have the pen? I do. We're going to get you a pen, okay? All right. Ray. We need a pen. Stat. <laughs> Ray is the keeper of the pens. Ray is the keeper of the pens. That's how, oh, man. Pick your color. <laughs> Woo! They were a high class on I know. <laughs> All right. So. Back up, back up, so, and back up again. So let me give you, let me give you a little... This is meant to be a symmetric curve, it's not perfect. You know. This is why I went into physics, not into, uh, yeah, that's bad. <laughs> symmetric, yes? If you were standing, forget about, forget about what this actually represents, okay? You're standing right here at the top of this little hill. And you look, you look to your left, you look to your right, you've got two valleys in either, in either case. And you say, hmm. It looks like the way, either direction, is just as treacherous one way or the other. Imagine you're with a fairly malicious friend now, who, for reasons that are not entirely clear, shove you down one side of the ravine. And now you're here. This situation does not look symmetric anymore. <coughs> this is what is known, this is, this is, a, this is a very well-known principle of physics known as spontaneous symmetry breaking. And so you've got, you're, you're describing it exactly right. I mean, there, there, is, there is a fundamental symmetry here that can be broken. Now, anybody want to know, tell me what, what actual thing I'm, I'm secretly describing in, in, in this? Higgs field. The Higgs field. This, this is what happens, this is how the, the, the Higgs field works um, in, in physics. So you start off with, you start off with a field that is sort of precariously balanced in equilibrium, and it turns out that there's a lower energy situation where it's not in equilibrium, where it's, it's away from the original equilibrium, but it finds a new, a new minimum. But which solution, and in fact there's an infinite possibility, which solution it picks is completely arbitrary. But once it's done that, you've got the situation where there's sort of like this constant field of energy floating around. And you know, e, if E equals MC squared, then the opposite is true. That you can get, if you have a constant field of energy, 
you can get mass out. There's your 10 second explanation as to you know, how the Higgs gives mass to things. Rightly, you've got a constant, you know, you've got a constant field flying around. So you're, abso you're absolutely correct that certain things can appear symmetric, um, they, they can appear symmetric, and typically they appear symmetric at very high energies. And then it's once you get to lower energies and they sort of settle out that things appear to be, uh, appear to be um, uh, asymmetric and, and the symmetry is broken, and usually in a totally arbitrary way. 